Okay, earlier in this chapter, I talked about the four key ways that we can calculate a delta H, an enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. And the first way was through calorimetry. So that's great. We can use the calorimetry to calculate the heat, the Q. Remember using our calor calorimetry equation. That was Q equals the mass times the specific heat times the delta T. So we can determine the Q value for the amount of heat required to accomplish something. But Q and enthalpy changes are not exactly the same thing. They're very closely related though. To determine the molar, that's the per mole, change in enthalpy, that's the delta H, we consider this generally as the amount of heat exchanged in a chemical process per mole of the substance reacted. So there's a relationship. So delta H equals the heat energy Q per mole of chemical substance that is reacted. So you can determine the Q heat exchanged, and then divide it by the number of moles of reactant, and you can get your delta H. Now I want to expand on this just a little bit. And to do that, I want to go back to our earlier diagram of where I drew the system and the surroundings. So do you recall when I drew this sketch where we have a chemical reaction that's taking place and we define that as the system? and then the surroundings, and heat can be either given off or from the system to the surroundings, or heat can be absorbed into the system from the surroundings. So heat can go in either direction. Well, this implies that there's a relationship between the heat of the system and the surroundings. And this is the relationship, that the Q of the system is the equal and opposite value of the Q of the surroundings. What does that mean? That means whatever the value of the heat is that is leaving the system is equal to the amount of heat that is being gained by the surroundings. Or if heat is going in the other, other direction, then whatever the value of the heat is that's being lost by the surroundings is equal in magnitude to the amount of heat that is being gained by the system. So that is a fundamental relationship. Remember, the heat cannot be created or destroyed. It has to go somewhere. So if the system is either gaining or losing heat, then the surroundings must be doing the exact opposite, either losing or gaining that exact same amount of heat. So that's a fundamental relationship between that relates the heat of the system and the surroundings when there is a heat being transferred between them. Let's go back now and see what this means. In a calorimetry problem, a common way to run a calorimetry reaction is to run the reaction inside an enclosed container. So for our purposes, let's just imagine that we've got a little plastic cup and we put a lid on it so that the heat can't get out too easily. So I have a plastic cup and the plastic cup has some solution in it and inside the solution there are chemicals that are reacting. And I'm going to put a thermometer down here in the cup and I'm going to measure the temperature of the water. And as the chemicals in the water in the solution react, let's say for example this is a, an exothermic reaction, and so the chemicals are going to be giving off heat into the surrounding water. Okay. So what is the system? The system is the chemicals that are reacting. 
the surroundings, in this case, would be the water. And the thermometer is measuring the temperature of the water. So the thermometer is measuring the temperature of the surroundings. So if the thermometer shows a heat increase, does that mean the system, the chemicals, are giving off heat? Yes. The system, the chemicals that are reacting, are losing their heat. So we would have, in this case, a negative Q for the system. And we would have a positive Q for the surroundings. That's one example of a calorimetry that can be done. What this means is we can calculate the Q of the surrounding water and then reverse its sign and we would end up with the Q of the chemical reaction. Then we could plug that Q in right here. So very often this Q, we stipulate that it's of the Q of the system that it's reacting and not of the surroundings, right? Because we want the Q, the heat, of the actual chemicals that are reacting and not the Q that we might be measuring as being given off to the surroundings. All right, but remember there is a basic relationship that the Q of the system equals the negative sign of the Q of the surroundings. So if the Q is a positive value, the Q of the system is a so if the Q of the system is a positive value, then the Q of the surroundings will be a negative value. If the Q of the system is a negative value, then the Q of the surroundings will be a positive value. And once we do that, we can get the Q of the system. It goes in there, and ta-da, we've got our equation for the change in enthalpy for a chemical reaction. So there we go. There, there's our first method for calculating the delta H for a chemical reaction using calorimetry. Okay. Let's work through a sample problem here. So, calculate the molar change in enthalpy. Let's think about what it's asking for. Change in enthalpy is the delta H, right? Molar change in enthalpy. So we want some amount of energy per mole. That's what this means, molar change in enthalpy. So we want some amount of energy, Q, per mole. We calculate that value, the molar change in enthalpy, and we'll have this answer. For the combustion of methanol, they give me the formula of methanol, tell me it's a combustion reaction. They give me a mass of the methanol, 15.5 grams. And there we're told that this reaction emits 351 kilojoules of heat energy. So what does this mean? Does this mean that the energy that is being released is a positive value or a negative value? Well, it is emitting this much energy, giving off this much energy. That means the amount of energy that's being given off into the universe is a positive value. So that's the surroundings, right? So the Q surroundings equals 351 kilojoules. Here's my mass. Okay, so I would like for you to try to work on this problem. See if you can pause the video and figure out how you're going to solve the problem, given the hints that I've provided. And when you're done working on that, then come back and I will work through it for you. Okay, well, let's think about this problem. What is it asking for? It's asking for the molar change in an enthalpy, which is a delta H. What is delta H? It is the Q, it is the heat that has been exchanged from that system, right? Per mole of reactant reacted. All right, 
Well, so that's basically the equation that I'm solving for. So let's bring it down here. Delta H equals the Q of the system, the heat of the system change per mole of reactant. Well, I'm not given these either of these numbers directly, am I? I'm not given the Q of the system, but I am given the Q of the surroundings. I'm told that this much heat energy was emitted into the surroundings as a positive number. Well, I know that Q of the system equals the negative value of the Q of the surroundings. So I know that the Q of the system is a negative 351 kilojoules. What does this mean? This means that this reaction has lost this much heat energy, has given off this much heat, so that the surroundings have gained that much heat. So now I have the value for the Q of the system. I can plug it in. Negative 351 kilojoules. I can use kilojoules here because kilojoules is a valid unit of heat energy. I'm not using the calorimetry equation for this, so I'm not going to be using a specific heat of methanol, so I don't have to convert this into joules. I'm just going to plug it in as a Q worth kilojoules here. Now I need the number of moles of this reactant, so I can plug it in down here and then solve my equation. Well, I'm not given moles, I'm given grams of methanol, so I need to do a gram to mole conversion. So let's do that really quickly. 15.5 grams of methanol, CH3OH. And how do you convert from grams to moles? Well, it's grams to moles. This is the molar mass per one mole, right? So I need to add up four hydrogens, one oxygen, and one carbon. And the molar mass of methanol is 32.04 grams. So if I do that math, 15.5 divided by 32.04, I get the number of moles of my reagent that were burned, three sig figs, so it's 0 0.484. moles of methanol. Well, now I can plug that into my equation. 0 0.484 moles of methanol. So you see how we got the Q of the system? We took the negative value of the Q of the surroundings. We had to recognize that we were being told the Q of the surroundings. When you're being told an amount of energy is emitted, that means that amount of energy is going into the surroundings. So we just took the negative value of that for the Q of the system. And that gave me the numerator. We were given the mass of the reagent, so we just converted that to moles and we plugged it in the denominator. And the rest is calculator work. And my answer is a negative answer, negative seven, two, Five, and what units? Kilojoules per mole. And there we go. We have just determined a delta H, a change in enthalpy, a delta H. And remember that was the whole point of this section was to be able to get to where we could determine a delta H if we were not given that value. So what does this say? This says that for every one mole of methanol that you burn, it's going to give off, it's an exothermic process, it's going to give off 725 kilojoules of energy. That's really exothermic. That's giving off a lot of energy for every mole of reactant. And indeed, this is a common feature of hydrocarbons. This is a hydrocarbon, right? Like methane and propane, and butane, and octane, or gas, or paper, or candle wax. Those are all hydrocarbons. And the reason that we burn hydrocarbons for energy 
is because they are very exothermic. For every amount of hydrocarbon we burn, we end up generating a lot of heat energy. And so that's why we burn them. They produce prodigious amounts of heat for every mole that we burn. So there's an example of using our Q to determine a delta H. Now just to re review, where could we get Q? Well, maybe we were just given the Q as we were in this problem. But what about if we weren't given Q in the problem and instead we were given calorimetric information? So maybe we were given the mass and the specific heat and the change in temperature. We might have to calculate Q. And then we could have something to plug in there if it weren't just given to us through that method. Okay? So this Q might even either be given to you in the problem or you might be given calorimetric information. So you would first have to use the calorimetry equation to solve for Q. Then if it's the Q of the surroundings, you take the negative value of it to get the Q of the system. And then you can plug it in here and get your molar enthalpy change per mole. Molar is per mole enthalpy change, the delta H per mole.